All right. Holy cow. I think we did it, ladies and gentlemen. We are doing this. Everybody, welcome to our live virtual event, whether you're watching us on YouTube, whether you are watching us on Facebook. On behalf of Zaya Tong and Jan Arden, I would like to welcome you as we dive into a big show. There it is, Jan Arden. There it is, Zaya Tong. I, I don't usually swear on TV, but because this is not traditional broadcast, I can say hashtag horseshit. Yes. <gasps> I can't believe I said it. Uh, ladies, welcome. And this is National Help a Horse Day. It is Monday, April the 26th. We are live Eastern time at 7 p.m. If you are catching us from anywhere on the west side, so we're three hours earlier, thank you to every single person who's tuning in right now. We are going to dive into a big discussion today. We have a lot to get to as we discuss banning live horse export from Canada. Before we do that, though, uh, although these lovely ladies need no introduction, why don't we do it anyway? So I am going to start with the lady to my right, I think, on screen right now, the one and only Zaya Tong. Hey, Zaya, <laughs> tell the people about yourself. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, it's an honor to be joining both of you here today. I'm Zaya Tong, and uh, I'm a science host, and I'm an author. I'm a lover of our fellow sentient beings and earthlings. And uh, right now, I serve on the board of the World Wildlife Fund International, and I also serve on the board of We Animals. And We Animals is an international network of photojournalists who go behind the scenes and really reveal the hidden lives of many animals and give voice to the voiceless. So whether that's animals in factory farms, in zoos, in circuses, or even live export. So really this is a, an issue and a topic that's really, really important to me and I'm thrilled to be here. And before we get started, I wanna say a huge thank you to Melissa who's done a tremendous amount of behind the scenes work to make this happen. And Jan Arden who is you know, an ardent cage rattler who has really brought this uh, issue to the floor. Oh, that is, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for being here. We're so excited to dive into this convo with you, Zaya. Uh, and speaking of Jan Arden, Jan Arden, over to you. Tell the people who you are. <laughs> I am a lover of all animals as well. I'm so proud to be here with you guys today, uh, Melissa and Zaya. I, I, I um, add to that sentiment of Melissa, my gosh, the behind the scenes work that goes into this, the questions that you formatted. We really are trying to um, have a conversation today to help people understand what live export is. As far as who I am, uh, I write some songs. I have lived a, a really blessed life in the arts. And, um, you know, I'm getting older. And a lot of people have asked me why I've gotten involved in animal advocacy and the horses in particular. Well, you know, you start thinking about living and you start thinking about mm -hmm. how everything wants to live. And I don't think I could have come to this conclusion or or this this whole thing had I been 25 years old. I was too busy living life and drinking beer and doing my things. But as I'm getting older, I realize how precious life is. And as an Albertan and as a Canadian, we um, have long revered and been so proud of being horse country. And on mm -hmm. the contrary, that's not happening in my province right now. So I will leave it as the conversation unfolds, but um, I'm an artist, I'm an animal, animal advocate, I'm a vegan, um, and that's part of my advocacy. It's part of how I protest the mistreatment of animals and how I feed my body and how I participate in saving the planet one meal at a time. So I'll mm. get it back to you, Melissa, and off we go. Off we go. Oh my gosh. Uh, thank you so much for that, Jan. Um, and I will do a very brief in introduction of myself. I'm Melissa Grello, and uh, I am um, the co-host of The Social on CTV, which is probably how most people know me. Uh, but anybody who has watched the show or who has followed my career, and even before my career, they will know that my family business is actually horses. And so I was born and raised into a family business that uh, breeds, trains, um, coaches people in dressage, which is our kind of riding. Um, and my family business celebrating 
45 years in business this summer. Uh, so that is a testament uh, mostly to the hard work of my parents uh, under the tutelage of my dad, who's a riding master, Frank Grello. And so when we talk about horses and we talk about horse welfare and animal welfare in general, that is the one thing I think that um, combines and brings the three of us together quite specifically. And even though all of our backgrounds are so different, I think that's why there are so many people who will wanted to tune in today as well, is because if you are an animal lover, it it's beyond just perhaps your dog or just perhaps your horse. We want to see all animals, especially animals in this country being cared for. And um, as soon as I had heard through Jan Arden, uh, what was happening specifically with live horse export. Um, you know, there is a dark underbelly to the horse business and I've always been aware of it, but I don't think I was prepared to know and learn just how horrific, unfortunately, uh, many parts of the horse industry actually are. And so that's what we're going to tackle here today. Um, again, it is National Help Horse Day because if you're able to stay tuned, we're going to be together for about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour for those of you who are tuning in right now. And this will all eventually lead to the end point, which is what can we all do? So we really hope that you stay tuned to the very end because that's what this is about. Educating everybody who is watching getting some answers to some questions. Some of you will be more familiar with this topic already than others. Others, you may be hearing this for the first time, but in the end, we all want the same goal, which is to make a difference and stop live horse export from this country. So on that note, which is where we're going to dive in, ladies, and I'm going to bring us all in uh, together here. We're going to start with some basics here. And, and before we actually dive in, I know all of you right now, I can see your comments coming in. Please keep those coming. We are going to hopefully have enough time for your questions at the end. So if you can, please keep commenting, but then I will pull in some questions very specifically at the very end for us to answer here. So I'm going to just do a very quick shout out because uh, there's a lot of you on here. So Plurpy, best wishes from Amsterdam. Okay. Thanks, Amsterdam. Thanks for oh, joining us. Uh, Sandra, I love horses. Deborah, hi everyone. Deborah Walkie, who's a long term uh, fan of the social as well. Denise, as well. Welcome, Denise. Um, so, Tammy Lynn, Kevin Slater, Sandra G. There's so many of you joining us. So, thank you. Please thank keep you. commenting. We're going to get your uh, you know comments and questions answered at the end. Okay, so we're going to dive in now to some of this. And we're going to start with the basics. And, Jen, I'm probably going to throw it to you for this. You know, what exactly is live horse export and why uh and, and maybe take us through a little bit of its history in this country the live horse exports as they are now were something that started in the united states in the pacific northwest uh basically uh, a company called shorno um agri business so they're they're touting themselves as a farm they shipped horses out of the continental United States to Japan. So somebody had this idea that it would be a great idea to make some money on shipping horses overseas, putting them on planes. Uh, the very first few flights went out on FedEx flights. So you can imagine uh, even the FedEx, I love you because they basically said after doing a few of these journeys with, with very large draft horses, in boxes. They didn't even really know how to send them at that point. Uh, imagine filling out the way bill on horses on your FedEx form. It sounds just bananas. Anyway, FedEx just said, no, it's too unethical for us. We want nothing to do with it. Uh, another thing was happening in the United States, and that was they were banning horse slaughter. And uh, they the Shorno company, long story, very short, they moved lock, stock and barrel when the horse slaughter industry sort of was coming to a fold, the access to the horses they could get that was all coming to an end. They moved up into Alberta. So they've been here since 2006 and they've been shipping the horses out. Basically, it is, uh, you know, a, a very arduous flight. And we're going to get to that as we go along. Um, uh, I've seen Melissa's questions, so I don't want to cover a whole bunch of stuff, but it's taking live horses four at a time, putting them into small wooden crates without food, without water, no headroom, uh, and putting them with the big forklift into the belly of uh, very large aircrafts. Imagine a Dreamliner, uh, 90 or 100 horses, no veterinary care, no compassion, no nothing. They are, it's like a two-day journey in that crate. Uh, 
peeing on each other, crapping on each other, turbulence, the whole nine yards. It's a horrific journey. They are flown to a small island off, uh, off the main island of Japan is where they land. And then they are slaughtered there and consumed as raw meat. And, and then that's a real uh, instrumental part of this. Um, because of the way they're consumed, horse meat is eaten all over the world, but a lot of it is, is killed domestically and flown in fairly big chunks, frozen. That's the difference with what's happening here. And we are not telling people what to eat. We are not telling them what they should or shouldn't be eating. That's not our fight at the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition. Our fight is for the humane and the, the right way to treat a, a live animal. And it is not putting it on an aircraft. That's live export in a nutshell. Um, it, it shouldn't be happening with any animal anywhere on this planet. They shouldn't be shipped. They shouldn't be. And especially in light of, uh, and Zaya can speak to this too, of, of what we're looking at now with COVID-19. Uh, you know, a virus that very much jumps from animals into human beings. So now we're taking very large animals and moving them a half a, a world away. Uh, we have to think about how that affects human health as well. So that's the basics. Yep. Carting them up, flying them to another place. And uh, it's just, nobody wins. Mm -hmm. So Zaya, you know, if I, if we really pull back, why is it that all Canadians you think should care about this issue? Well, I think that many of us will recognize that horses are iconic and i've heard jan say this and it's very true that you know this country was really built on the backs of horses um horses are a part of the livelihoods of indigenous people and settlers dating back to about the 1700s so um horses have done so much hard work for us whether it's pulling sleighs in quebec or whether it's working at the mills whether it's transportation whether it's working even with with our police forces you know they they really are a part of our culture if you think of for example the Calgary Stampede but perhaps where they are most identified with uh, being Canadian is of course the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and so think about that for a moment think about the fact that Mounties they're on our coins they're, they represent Canada and imagine if those horses were sent over for sashimi and the truth is, there is no difference between those horses and the horses that we're talking about today. These are Canadian horses, and we should care about them because they are sentient beings. Yeah, they are. And and really, that's, you know, where I wanted to jump in is because, um, you know, there is a really emerging um, industry within the horse world of equine therapy. And it's it's not new, but it's definitely something that is gaining more mainstream attention. Yeah. And it is literally horses being used for therapy. And in sometimes cases where traditional therapies, psychotherapy and the like are ineffective. And so when you talk about just how sentient horses are. I mean, you know, for example, maybe more people have experience with dogs as an example. And, and I often will describe some horses like a big dog <laughs> where they are reading your mind. They are reading your body language. They understand your mood sometimes better than you do. It's almost as if they can see what you need. And, and the bigger picture here is, is they're huge, but they, my dad always has this saying, you know, it's a big horse, little brain. And what he means by that is they run very, very much on instinct. They are pack animals. They're, they're herd animals, I should say. And when there is a group of horses together, which is how they are meant to be, when you talk about feelings and emotions, when there's a horse that is afraid, that feeling is literally jumping to every single horse in the herd. That is survival. And so when we go back to some of the conditions that you described at the beginning, Jan, the thing that always strikes the most fear in my heart is that fear multiplied by, what is it, 90, 100 horses that are on a flight? Exactly. Um, I can't imagine uh, that kind of terror f lasting for hours and days on end um, because I am so keenly and acutely aware how smart they are, but certainly how the herd is supposed to protect them and conversely scare the wits out of them when they realize they feel like they're dying, you know, or en route well, to that. I've been to many loads at the airport when the horses come in 
Uh, it's interesting, they use Hutterites basically to drive the trucks. That's who they get to drive the trucks. We're not even sure um, exactly how they're paid, but uh, you have to understand these, these horses really have forfeited their lives. They're raised in, in feedlots. So the bulk of these horses, like 80, 90% of the horses that do end up on these aircrafts are purpose bred which means that, you know, they are inseminated, they, uh, they give birth here on Canadian soil in massive feedlots, and they are modeled after cattle. And there's a million reasons why it doesn't work. Uh, like you said, they're very sentient, they're very smart. Uh, they have no veterinary care whatsoever. They have uh, a lot of problems with colic and, you know, j just a lot of problems that horses have with very delicate um, intestinal tracts. Uh, they're fed in giant troughs. A truck comes along and spews out this mush. Um, the cheapest stuff they can feed them to fatten them up. But there's thousands of them in these feedlots. And they literally go from a feedlot standing in their own feces, in their own urine. They, they are never in a green field, folks. They're never running wild. It's not, it's not that at all. They go from these feedlots as depressed, downtrodden, severely neglected animals herded onto these trucks, they're, they're hit and whacked in the back of the flanks to get them onto these trucks. And they're all loaded on. They're afraid from the word go. The, the, the trucks go in all weather, uh, whether it's the, the scorching heat of summertime, 30, 35 degrees, or 40, 50 below with wind chill, they're crammed on those trucks. And when they get to the airport, I think the real kicker for me um, is that they are put into uh, a part of the Calgary airport. They're flown out of Calgary, Winnipeg, Edmonton. My experience is with the Calgary airport. That's where I live. Um, this is the same building where some of the most expensive and beautiful horses on the planet are mm -hmm. flown into. So it's kind of, it was built for something very different. We have a lot of jumping competitions here because we have Spruce Grove here. Spruce Meadows, sorry, Spruce yep. Meadows are here. Uh, that's the same building that celebrates some of the most beautiful horses, most expensive horses in the world. And here's where these horses very reluctantly are hit, smashed, whacked in the head, whacked in the back and forced into these crates of horses they may not know. And Melissa, you and I spoke to this uh, the other day about, you know, horses being companion animals. Yes, they do form relationships. And I'm going to tell you, they're, they don't go out of their way to make sure they're in with horses that they know. And it's a two day journey in there. They're loaded in, in the afternoon in these buildings and it's all wrapped up. So you can't see them. Uh, the crates are flimsy. Uh, they stand there for eight to 10 hours. If the flight is on time, it, they always fly them out at the middle of the night, four in the morning. And um, we've also seen planes sit there for another eight hours before they fly on a 14 hour journey. And we have no idea how long the load takes, depending on if they land properly, they could be standing another four, five, six hours then. So you are going into well into 30 or 40 hours that these horses endure. Um, and I just wanted to make a quick point too, when you talked about the equine therapy that a lot of autistic people are, are experiencing now and benefiting from, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that, that benefit from these therapies. Um, these horses have, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified and they, they live in terror, but it's funny to see the guys that are shipping them off. These, this handful of men that are basically running this operation, this very sinister operation. They are horse owners themselves. They are ranchers and they have horses that they're proud of and that they ride and that they look after and that they feed and that are in barns in the dead of winter. Uh, the conflict for me there is what are we? Are we horse people or are we not? And I think mm -hmm. Canadians are waking up to the absolute hypocrisy in men that claim they're horse people when this is a, this is a Canadian horror story is what it is. So why don't we get into that question? You know, who are the stakeholders here? Um, you know, we hear that this practice has been happening here for a very long time. So you had mentioned off the top there, Jan, some of the, the you know, the originating companies that were doing this. And so if we start with where are the horses 
coming from. This is illegal. This practice is illegal in the United States. It's not illegal in Canada, which is why the horses are getting shipped from Canadian cities. Where are these horses coming from? Like I said, 80 or 90% of them are, it's a, they're bred here. They're bred, these large draft horses are bred to be shipped out. Um, they're shipped out very young, they're 18 months old. They just need them big enough. Uh, and because of course, you, much like cattle, you're dealing with weight. And because they, the, um, the market for the clients that are eating the raw uh, horse meat, uh, it's important for the importers, they want large musculature. So the more musculature they can have, the more bang for the buck basically they get. But it is five companies, five small companies that are calling themselves farms. So they reap the benefits of t taxes because they're calling themselves farms. Um, and further than that, taxpayers are paying for any kind of inspections that go on in these big feedlots. That's taxpayer money. Say that one money. more time. That, that is our money. Is that, yes. a federally, is that at the federal level? It's at the federal level. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's federal money that pays for uh, the, the CFIA inspections. Or it's all taxpayer government money. Okay. And uh, people need to understand that too. So it is these four or five companies, that's it. It's not, it does not employ hundreds of Canadians. It does not put food on the tables of Canadians. It does not even put food on the tables of hardworking, uh, the Asian community. It doesn't, it, it's not that. This is a very niche business. I would liken it to, you know, something that's very expensive that the average person doesn't go around eating a lot. That's what this is. But you, the, the really funny thing is the posters that the, the clientele that are buying the meat, they are shown posters of these majestic animals with the long manes that we're used to seeing, like a Disney horse, hmm. you know, uh, yeah. running in green pastures and having this life of freedom. And they, they have a hideous life. If they spend any time on the other end uh, in Japan, I, I'm sorry, the little island escapes me where they, they end up going and where it's all processed. Um, they go right into another feedlot. Um, and they could be there for two or three weeks, but they're in a very small feedlot to be fattened up one more time so that, you know, the meat is exactly how they want it. They don't meet, they don't have any kind of life. They have no kind of life. There's a, the other small percentage, Melissa, that you were speaking of is where the horses come from. Um, some of them still are coming from auctions. Um, and you have to understand that the inspection process is really still really horrible. There's a lot of uh, horses that people own that are their pets that get antibiotics, that get medicines that are not fit for human people to eat. Um, it's not good for them. And actually the Bovary slaughterhouse here in, in Alberta has been caught many times of processing horses that are not fit for human consumption. And they have been fined many times for that reason. But these, uh, they do come from auctions. So your pet that you think is going to end up in a nice, you know, farm down the road, it's it, the majority of people at auctions are meat buyers. The majority of people sitting in the stands at auctions all across the West, and a lot of them in Ontario as well, they're all meat buyers. And people that are in sanctuaries or rescues have a hell of a time trying to outbid with very little funding that they have to save some of those horses from the line. And by the line, I mean domestic slaughter. And we're not even going after domestic slaughter. That's an entirely different conversation. Our sliver that we're really concentrating on is the three or 400 horses that go out every month from Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Calgary. And we want to stop the live export because it's not right. So Zaya, you know, um, where is all of this going down? We, we, we are talking about, you know, like Jan said, such a small sliver. There's, this is a very niche market. And so where exactly, you know, like what are the problems 
that you see from your perspective with all of this in terms of where they're going and, and your biggest issues and concerns with this practice? I think that Jan did a great job of outlining some of the primary concerns that just about anybody would have. I think one of the biggest things that we have to keep in mind is that horses actually die in the process of live export. That's been documented. Uh, horses get trampled in the process of live export. In fact, you know, for me, a lot of times people are like, oh my goodness, the slaughter is the worst part. When I first learned about live export, that was what made me stop eating meat because I, when I started learning about what happens and it's incredibly graphic and I want to let everybody who's listening at home realize that um, Melissa, Jan and I had a conversation before our conversation tonight about whether we were even gonna show any images or any video and we decided it wasn't a good idea. Um, we wanted to leave this uh, to your own imaginations to some degree because you cannot unsee some of this stuff. And as Jan mentioned, you know, their lives, even before you get to slaughter, are really quite dreadful. You know, you've got these young babies. These are baby horses. I mean, can you imagine if we did this to puppies? Would we be exporting puppies? Would we be okay with this? Absolutely not. But these are, you know, two-year-old horses, 18 months old. They're stuck out in the freezing cold, as Jan said, minus 30 degrees, minus 50 degrees sometimes when it gets really cold, no shelter being transported, being trampled, no food or water, sometimes for periods beyond the 28 hours that are mandated, up to 36 hours if there's de-icing or delays. And um, the entire process, as you even said too, Melissa, working with these animals as flight animals is torturous. And so um, it's highly problematic on, on many levels. So absolutely, we need to ban live export. I mean, that's one thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And we can maybe talk a little bit about some of the legal changes that we need to start making as well. So let's get to that in terms of um, who is in charge of this in Canada? You know, so if, if we're all here together because we're raising awareness, the next step is obviously action. And, and Jan, I know you've been doing so much work on that front. So who is in charge of live horse export and then theoretically has the power, hopefully because of pressure from the people, to stop the practice? So the, uh, the, the, only, the only people in charge of them, it's the Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah. It's the Canadian government. They hold all the cards. The Ministry of Agriculture are exactly the only people who allow, who, who enable who bless the live shipment of these horses. It's the Ministry, Minister of Agriculture and the it's the Canadian, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is a joke. Uh, anyone that has written a letter to the Minister of Agriculture gets back a form letter. Uh, Melissa, you got back a form letter because I know you yep. wrote to your member of parliament. Yep. Um, they get back a form letter that just says, you know, we, we oversee this. No, you don't, you don't oversee anything. I've never seen the other loads I've seen. There, there, there's a guy standing there. Um, it's a veterinarian, which to me is uh, the biggest hypocrisy of, of all. You have someone that has sworn an oath to protect life and to, he's a, a doctor of animals. And they, they basically just, they scribble something on a, on a clipboard and they sign off on the horses. I've never seen a horse checked. I've never seen a hoof picked up. I've never seen an eyeball looked. I've never seen a sample of anything. Nobody does anything. Uh, and and we're going to get to that. But they don't see the um, the uh, Canadian Food Infection Inspection Agency. That was Freudian. Uh, doesn't um, they they don't even follow their own rules. Uh, uh, these large horses are supposed to be shipped by themselves in their own separate crates. It's not, it's not feasible for them financially. And so they just have gotten away with it so long because they don't think Canadians care. They don't think Canadians see. And for the last 15 years, Canadians haven't seen. If you could see these feedlots f from the air, uh, W5, for instance, did a piece about eight weeks ago and they have drone footage of the feedlots and these horses are filthy. They look so bedraggled, they're so tangled up. Their feet are in such disrepair. It's depression. It's, it's such a profound, 
tactile feeling of doom that these horses have. They know there's no, there's no hope. There's a hopelessness. Nothing should have to live like that. But yeah, it's the Ministry of Agriculture, Mo. It's, that's who it is. And uh, Zaya, do you have her, you have our minister's name? Yes, Andy. that's right. Marie-Claude Bibo. She is an MP and uh, I believe you tried to invite her to come and join us in this conversation. And I'm guessing that the radio silence is a, a decline. Uh, but what we have to kind of keep in mind, of course, is that the Ministry of Agriculture's goal is to increase exports, right? And how do they see horses? They see horses as livestock and they are actually listed on the website as merchandise. So it's a problem when we see live beings, smart, intelligent beings as products, right? Because that's a that disincentivizes the minute that you consider them livestock. So that's one of the strategies that people are considering right now is why not change their legal designation from livestock to companion animals, especially as you were talking and mentioning the equine therapy earlier. In fact, a poll was done uh, not too long ago that most Canadians do consider horses companion animals. And what is the difference with companion animals? We don't eat companion animals, right? We don't export them for slaughter. But we also do need to think about the legislation around breeding for slaughter as well. And along with that, because there is no legislation along those lines, we really need to think about the full life cycle of horses. Uh, one of the things that's, that's, you know, messed up with the system right now is that it's cheaper and more economical to actually send horses off to become horse meat or sashimi in some instances than it is to give these horses a uh, really good end of life care. So think about this. Again, we were talking about the fact that a lot of these horses have dedicated their lives uh, in service, the ones that aren't bred for slaughter. And I was reading about what they're doing in Poland, which I found really interesting. Um, the horses there that work the police dogs and the police horses is they're given a pension, right? Because yeah. they really recognize the work that these horses have done for their entire careers. Yeah. And what a wonderful way to think about end of life care for these animals, right? You gave your entire life for us, we're gonna give something back to you. Looking at what's happening in New Zealand very recently, they banned live export, the live shipping of many of their cattle and sheep uh, overseas on ships because they have a really strong recognition of how horrific and inhumane that is. So the entire purpose of having lawmakers, of having MPs, of having senators is to change the law to stick with the times. Otherwise, we would all be, you know, going along with the codes of Hammurabi from ages ago, you know what I mean? We can change laws for other countries that absolutely do this. And Canada often touts itself and is really proud of being very progressive. But it's really important that our legislators really walk the talk. And as we can talk about a little bit more later, we need to all become cage rattlers, all of us who are listening here, because the more we use our voice, the more we are able to bring this to public attention. And public attention is what changes public policy. So it absolutely can change. We've seen it happen in many other countries and we can do the same right here. So uh, before we actually dive into some of the solutions and some things that we can try to all do collectively, Jan, why hasn't it stopped yet? Is it literally because it's been happening out of sight and people are simply not aware? Is that why it's gone on this long in this country? Well, I think so. I think uh, the like the Llewellyn, uh, the, the big feedlot uh, is a guy named Bill Llewellyn that has, you know, feedlots all over Alberta that are massive. And, and they basically will tell you that they're just farmers making a living. You know, we're just making a living. Um, and I, I don't know what they think. You know, there's he, the guy's actually on tape saying the horses, they walk right into their crates and they go to sleep and they don't mind being there. <laughs> And I'm just like, wow, it, it's so delusional that I guess if you tell yourself something long enough, you believe it. Money is that much of an incentive. They have quietly made $20, $25 million year in, year out. Um, you know, it's interesting. This all started, you know, way back in the 70s with horses being airlifted. It's been going on a long time, not to this degree. But the USDA in 2006, so the, the, the part of the U.S. government that does the inspections, they pulled the funding. 
and it stopped. So once they pulled the funding for the inspections, that's when everything moved up to Canada. And I think Canadians are under this impression that Canada is so forward thinking and that, we we, that we're way ahead of the curve internationally. And Canadians need to wake up and understand that we have some of the worst animal welfare laws on the planet. It's certainly in the, in the uh, in first world countries. Um, longest travel times. Uh, it, it's, it's really, there is no animal welfare laws really. There, people just get away with anything. What W5 just showed, uh, they, they re-aired a, a piece on Paragon Farms. It's a, it's a pig farm in Ontario that breaks any kind of lame code that we may have in existence. And they do it because they think people don't care. They think people don't care about horse export and people don't know about it, Melissa. It, this is all about awareness. This, this entire horseshit campaign has been about telling people this is what we do. Internationally, it looks terrible. It's a very small part of Canadian agriculture that brings us down. We have a saying in music, that you're only as good as the worst guy in your band. Huh. And this piece of Canadian ag, the shipping of live export in general is horrible, but because of the nature of how horses are, how smart they are, they're flight animals. Imagine we're prepared for turbulence on a plane because we have a pilot coming on saying, we're gonna be going through 30 minutes of turbulence, please put your seat belts on. We are told to buckle down because we could get injured. These horses have had grave injuries. Like Zaya stated, they've had many, many deaths and they've had many crippling injuries that nobody's privy to. We, we don't get to know. When the planes take off from Canadian soil, it is now the problem of the importer. And that's part of the regulations in trading with, with animals as commodities. They treat them like you're lifting off a, a bunch of radios into the air. Well, it's not, now it's not, now it's part of the importer's problem. So, and the importer is under no, has no responsibility to anybody to report death, to report injury, to report anything that goes very wrong, which it does. I've been on hundreds and hundreds of flights in my life. I have seen people fly through the cabin on dozens of occasions and been very glad that I'm strapped down. These horses are not strapped to anything. They're standing in a crate. So, you know, we can talk about this forever and ever and ever and go around in circles. What they're doing is unethical. It's unbelievably cruel. And to put any animal through unnecessary pain, which is why I'm not talking about domestic slaughter. I'll tell you right now, and I'll say this, on, on, on air, I would rather see them killed here. I would rather see them take a two hour ride to Bovary and be slaughtered here and sent frozen to other countries. The live part of this is grotesque. Okay, I, we're gonna get to those solutions now and some of what we are hoping to achieve with this chat. And so uh, before we get to that, it, only because it had popped up um, on social media, um, and, and this is a question I'm gonna throw to you, Zaya. Uh, you and I are both half Asian and there is other discussions happening very much. There's a lot going on in the world these days. And one of those is also anti-Asian racism. And so one might ask, what does that have to do with this discussion? And yet it did bubble up a little bit on social media. And, and someone had asked the question, is this a form of anti-Asian racism? Are we making a judgment or a statement about how, how people in another country eat. What is your response to that? Well, I'm grateful to the person for bringing it up, right? Because I still think it's an issue that deserves attention. And uh, I just found it a little strange that um, I was being accused of being anti-Asian when I'm Asian <laughs> or half Asian. <laughs> and I was trying to explain, but we're actually Asian. So I want to make mm -hmm. a distinction that I think is really important because speaking the truth, um, that shouldn't be censored. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Like we're actually speaking about basic facts now. And so are these horses being exported for sashimi? Yes, that is a fact. But the further distinction to make is here what we're doing is we're being very specific with the facts. Where problems start to arise is when people generalize. So I'll give you an example. When people start to call all Asian people or all Chinese people dog eaters, that's racist. And there's a reason for that. For example, I grew up in Hong Kong and I can tell you I have never in my life seen dog on the menu. I have never eaten dog. I don't know anybody in my family or my friends who have eaten dog. And so when you do a sweeping generalization like that, yes, that's absolutely problematic. But saying geese are turned into a cuisine called foie gras, that's a fact. Saying that there's a, a dog meat festival in China where people eat dog, that is a fact. Saying that these horses are exported for sashimi is a fact. And so it's really important to be able to make that distinction because we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be censored uh, from the truth here at all. I think that that's very, very important. So I'm glad that the person brought it up, but I think that there is a, an important distinction to be made between racist generalizations and speaking the truth. Okay, so we're going to get to the big part now. Big finish, ladies. Big finish. What can we do to stop it? This is big. So what are what are we trying to do here tonight? Um, what is the end goal? And how do we get there with the people who are watching and other people who are just like either waking up to this for the first time or have been fighting the fight for decades? What's the end goal? And how do we get there together? Well, awareness um, is everything. I think where we've come from in the last year, the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition has been uh, led by some of the most fierce, amazing women I've ever met. And they do, they have kind of caregivers fatigue at this point. They've been doing it single-handedly. I'm so proud to be involved with um, these people that have just really been trying to, to get awareness. So I think that has been my role in this, to be a spokesperson as a public person um, it's something near and dear to my heart. I think love has a lot to do with with animal advocacy. I think, you know, teaching your children about appreciation of animals. And, uh, you know, this squarely falls into a next generation of people here and abroad that feel differently about how they're consuming what they're what's on their plates. You know, that makes a big difference. I think it's really important not to shame people. Um, I really am not judging anyone eating the horse sashimi, and I know that sounds contradictory to my to my message and to the coalition's message. We really want to go back to no. It is the shipping of the horse. It's the physicality of putting a being on a plane. So sign the petition, horseshit.ca. That's why we said horseshit because it's a very easy thing to remember. Sometimes people rattle off websites, and you're like dot org slash double space semicolon capital this is horseshit.ca if you go to horseshit.com it's a porn site we found that out the hard way so uh, <laughs> i don't even know why i don't have the connection there but that's okay uh, yeah uh, who who knew but this is uh yeah it, sign the petition the government does recognize people signing their name, taking two minutes to add. We have 32, 33,000 signatures on a government petition. That is one of the, it, actually it is their top pet petition on the government website now. Um, at, and just supporting, you know, supporting the coalition. It is important to donate. We have a legal uh, battle right now, trying to fight. We, we lost in court telling the, the Canadian food, you know, people that you're not following your own recommendations and your own regulations as to how these horses are flown. So we wanted to come at it from all sides. And that's why the lawsuit is important too. It's to keep that pressure on. This is a constant pressure. Um, if you want any, to stop anything from bleeding, and I'm no doctor, Zaya Tong, uh, you, have to, you have to keep that, that firm pressure on it. Uh, people are waking up to it. W5 did a masterful piece of just showing people how awful it is for the horses. Um, and you know what? It's five, five families. I don't think Canada deserves to lose its standing 
in the international agricultural arena because of something that we do, which very few other countries do with, with horses. Um, we are one of the top suppliers of horse meat, horse meat on the planet. Horseshit.ca, sign the petition. Tell your friends, awareness, awareness, awareness. And, you know, be kind about it. Um, everyone loves animals. I truly believe that in my heart. And everyone wants to know how to help. And it really is just keeping the pressure up. So with that, um, I certainly know that I've learned a lot with everybody today. Um, again, I do want to remind and reiterate uh, what you had said earlier, Zaya, that um, I had uh, reached out to uh, Minister Bibo, uh, our Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Marie-Claude Bibo. She's a, a Liberal MP. I did uh, send an invitation uh, to make her aware that this was happening tonight and uh, for either a comment or to join us. And I did not have a response. Uh, but I'm going to tell you who is responding, ladies. Uh, it is our amazing um, group of people who have joined us here tonight. And I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out. I know everyone's lives are so busy. So I wanted to now um, move it over to your questions. And I'm going to just flip it over to the comments. And so um, so this is a great question that has come up from, uh, Susan Crow. Um, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, what is the next step with the petition that, uh, what MPP is endorsing or advocating it? What are the steps for petitions to become a bill or a policy? That's a great question, Susan. Uh, anybody want to take a crack at that? Uh, the MP is, his name is Nathaniel Erskine. And he's one of the few MPs that takes animal welfare issues to the floor. Uh, our, our petition is sponsored by Mr. Erskine and we're very grateful to him. Um, he's very vocal about animal welfare across the board. And uh, I also wanna give a shout out to um, Elizabeth May who has been so supportive of us as well. She's a big animal advocate. And as you know, uh, one of these, one of, one of our government officials that really does care about the planet, um, you know, the climate crisis and all those things. Um, yeah, it's Nathaniel Erskine and, and the petitions, if they see names on them, uh, obviously we'd, we'd love to get more. I'd love to get up to a hundred thousand. Uh, so it's just letting people know that it's easy to do and and that it's just one click away but uh, and and you can certainly nathaniel is on twitter and i believe he's on instagram so nathaniel erskine you'll, you'll find him quite easily perfect um this is another question coming in this is from stephanie wilson leonard a question this is about the shipping but is there also pushback plan to change the feedlot conditions that were mentioned earlier great question stephanie they no. have no they have no intention of changing feedlots they do it the, the cheapest they can. The trucks going along this trop and spewing out this stuff is the saddest thing. It, it actually gives me a lump in my throat. And they're so reluctant even to walk up to it to eat it. Um, I mean, can I ask like a logical question is, if the if if this was you mentioned earlier in the states, you know, as soon as the FDA or whoever was govern the governing body there stopped paying for the inspections, which means if you're not going to get inspected, the stuff can't leave. And then, of course, that's when it shut down in the states and came up to Canada. If this were to stop, even though the live export part, which is the goal here specifically, is to stop the live export part, you're saying that the feedlots will continue to exist because. Perhaps if the shift then becomes slaughter domestically, there will still be a demand for that horse meat and therefore the feedlots to exist. Is that what I'm understanding? The, the difference is that the reason they take such time and attention and spend the money to get these horses overseas is that's where the money is. To slaughter a horse domestically is almost a moot point. There really is no monetary gain in it. They will never see returns like they are with these large draft, healthy, large draft horses. Um, you know, when you are, it's like, I think everyone, all of our viewers have, have at least heard about Kobe beef. Yeah. Uh, the, it's very, it's very expensive. I mean, uh, there's lots of things on social media where you see people eating a hamburger that's worth $5,000. 
Um, and so this is kind of what's attached to the horses where the clients are eating it overseas. And it's a very prestigious, you know, very, you know, fine dining. It's an expensive thing to do. It's not something that the average person would ever be able to afford. Um, so I think, you know, there's that attached to it, but domestically to do that here, they would never get the money for it because mm. horses aren't consumed that way here. Um, I'll give you an example, even in Alberta where these horses are shipped out from on top chef Canada, several years ago, a horse was offered on the menu of one of the finals. They, they pulled the episode from television. There was such an uproar about eating horse. You would never see horse on an Alberta menu. I think the only place you would probably see it is in Quebec. Um, there's still a lot of older people there. It's not the younger people because it's very cultural. You know, they're still eating horse, but they eat it cooked like a steak or a roast or uh, ground up for hamburgers. Um, but that's the difference. The domestic part of slaughter, it, they just would never make that. It wouldn't be worth their while. It wouldn't be worth their while to keep the feedlot. So what happens also when you're talking about, this is a very long question or answer, I'm sorry. Um, the breeding programs have to be stopped. It has to be, the purpose bred stuff for overseas for this live exporting has got to be shut down by the government. They basically have to come in and say, 2023 folks, it's over. So whatever you got left in the, you know, what do we do with the horses we have now? So I understand there's a time sensitive thing here that it has to be done properly because we don't want anyone going out into a field and shooting a bunch of horses in the head either. And that's mm -hmm. basically probably what these guys would say to us. Well, what do we do with 3000 horses? Stop breeding them. Stop breeding them. Mm -hmm. Full stop. That's where the government has to step in. That comes there with is. a petition and that mm -hmm. comes with people, people being vocal about it. So the, there, there's a question up, which, you know, we may have covered to some degree, but it does keep coming back up, ladies, which is, uh, this is from Deborah Walkie. Why, so why are we allowing this here? Who is benefiting? And there was another question earlier, which is related, which you keep mentioning, Jan, that there are five families. That's guess, the people. only people benefiting. That's the, I, it sounds ludicrous, but all the research has been done. There is no, this is not part of the gross national product of Canada. This is five families that have been doing this for 40 or 50 years. It's generational, gets under the rug every time. I don't, like I said, the taxation, I, they're a farm. They have all the benefits of a farm as far as how they're taxed. Nobody benefits. I would add to that a little bit because I think, um, as Jan is saying, there are direct financial benefits. There are people who are making, you know, fifteen dollars, fifteen million dollars a year on this. Uh, you know, just these these families. Yes. But our government, of course, too, is is complicit in this because the way in which we view animals, you know, Canada is the, I believe, the third largest live exporter of animals in the world. We yep. export about 22 million animals every single year, not including horses. So when you look at the way the government looks at this, when they see horses as livestock, as merchandise, as products, what ends up happening is they're like, oh, these these nasty animal rights activists, if we give them the horse, what are they gonna want next? They're gonna want us to stop the pigs and the cows and the other sentient creatures. And you know, I understand that logic. I certainly do, but I, I hope- Well, they should. We can, exactly, exactly, they should. You know, I mean, just yesterday, the, the, the documentary that won the award for the best documentary at the Oscars was of course, uh, My Octopus Teacher. And yes. you can sit down and you can watch a documentary like this and you can actually fall in love with an octopus. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, which, is, which is wonderful. And, and in those moments, we, we really fall in love with the animals that surround us. And then there's that sort of speciesism where we decide to split our brains in half and so and carnism where we're like, oh, but we eat these animals. So suddenly we can treat them a different way. And I think really um, the future that we're moving to 
really requires us to think very, very differently about our animals and our fellow earthlings. There's a reason that we're in as much trouble as we are today, as, as Jan mentioned, obviously, with the pandemic that we're in, with the extinction crisis that we're in, with the biodiversity loss. It's because we're the only species on Earth that feels that we have the right to kill everything. And I think that it's really about time that we reassert our thinking. So um, there is that personal benefit and the, the money, and this is something that we can certainly address and bring forward, but our government needs to have a better approach to how we treat our fellow beings. Mm, great point. Um, Amanda writes to us, do we know what airlines are allowing this? You had mentioned FedEx. They got off this train a long time ago, Jan. Um, is it a specific airline? I mean, or is it's this K Korean Air is their main character? Air car carrier, sorry, it's Korean Air. That's okay. the main carrier, so and and okay. we have no idea who pays, and we have no idea how much the flights are. It's information that we have tried to get for a long time, but we have. I mean, I guess you could assume that the Shorno Group pays for the flights. I can't imagine. Uh, the costs on that, but they're getting about 5,000 Canadian dollars per head of horse. So if you do the math, if they're shipping a hundred horses, just to make it easy, you know, there's a half a million dollars going out. Um, so it doesn't seem like a lot, but do that twice a month and do it out of three cities. That's where right. you get your, that's where you're getting the 20 to 25 million in just pure profit yeah um you know uh, when we don't even know when you're talking about and yes the canadian government certainly is complicit in all this you know you you often wonder what are the trade-offs because obviously I, I mean i've been involved in protests in front of the japanese consulate in downtown calgary and they didn't want us in front of their building at all because we were carrying signs mm. um you know they they just don't want us there but you know in the big picture how do we know what what trade? What does the Canadian government get if if we continue to export the horses? So we have to think of those backroom deals that are going on and just how important it is. But um, I just don't think it's a big enough thing for the government to really invest any more of its time or money into. It, it just I makes mean, no I, sense. It's not that's why I Canadian. put it on. I put it up here that Christine Rondeau writes Transport Canada must have all the information on this. It, it seems very logical, correct, that Transport Canada would have all the information about these flights? Uh, it's certainly nothing that we've been able to get. Uh, and I went to uh, the coalition when I, when you gave me the questions. I said, you know, who is paying for this stuff? And and uh, the answer was just, we, we don't know. Uh, but it's uh, Korean Air is one of the last carriers that will do it. So, you know, I've done lots of tweets pressuring them, you know, saying mean things and using my rage, which only makes me feel sick. And I'm sure it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I just in COVID, you know, oh, it's it's money for them as well. Their international flights have all been halted. Yeah. So for them, a great point. it's they, I, I think they like having you know six flights they can count on every month that go out of canada mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are a big chunk of money let's face it there's no in cabin service for these horses they get nothing mm. listen um we have two minutes left before we go off the air um i do want to say a huge thank you to you zaya tong to you jan arden uh we came together from our various backgrounds um for a united cause. Uh, I think everyone's questions and comments, um, certainly there's a lot of passion out there. I think a lot of us feel the same way. So I think we will end on making sure that people understand that it will, it, it's the power of the people. It's only ever been in the history of governments, the power of the people uh, to actually change anything. Um, and so I hope that that's what this conversation brings to bear in the big picture of, of the big fight, which is to stop live horse export from Canada. And I think the more people that know about it um, and clearly understand how horrific it is for animals that we believe are being treated well in this country and learning are not 
in all cases. Um, so last comments. I mean, we've got a minute left. Zaya, you want to do used to doing things in under a minute. So I'll say it really quickly. Just a big thanks to you both. Big thanks to everybody who's listening. In the words of Joanne MacArthur, who is the founder of We Animals, action is catharsis. You don't have to save all the creatures in the world. Save one horse. Join horseshit.ca. Sign up work together we can raise some funds for one horse and get them to a sanctuary get them protected buy yourself a t-shirt and also have a wonderful <laughs> horse day Jen, yes yeah don't ever think that you can't do anything don't ever think that your compassion is everything your kindness is everything love really is important we all love animals and i think it's just been, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to understand, even in my own mind. You know, I ate animals most of my life, but something broke in my head and in my heart. And I just wanted to go forward. So you can do a lot of good. Um, apathy is our enemy to, to not bear witness to difficult things that happen with animal care. I don't want to see those videos either, but I watch them because I pay respect and I just want to, send as much dignity and grace to those animals as I can. That's what activism is about. That's why people stand in front of the pig trucks going into slaughter and the chicken trucks going into slaughter is they want to send a, a modicum of love and affection and appreciation to these animals. And um, don't ever think that that's lost. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa Grello. You are Melissa, a star in my heart. So I, you you are you are superb and and you you took this by the horns you said jan what can i do to help you let's get zaya let's let's talk about this and i you are thank you that this is how you make a difference this is how this is it listen it doesn't end here this is really just part of the big push that we are all doing this together and uh listen it is my honor it is my pleasure to be a part of this in any small way that i can um and i love seeing you both um and the fact that we can unite on something as important as this really really is um it's just something small that i can contribute and most importantly to everybody who's been writing us and saying that they're signing keep getting the word out listen i know it's a wild time in our lives but if you're at home and instead of doom scrolling and you know <laughs> Do something good with one of those squirrels and go to horseshit.ca um, and make a difference. Ladies, this is it. Uh, perhaps we can do this again soon. And listen, if there's any big updates, get us on all of our social media channels. And Jan especially will be watching uh, if there's any big breakthroughs that, uh, that come. Um, and let's do this again soon, ladies. It's great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much, everybody. Stay Thank positive. You. Stay positive. We Stay positive. get this done. Okay. Bye for now. You got it. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.